Uh, for those of you that are new, uh, starting in September, we've been going through um, the book of Mark together. And uh, if you, whether you believe it or not, we're only at the end of chapter 7, and we started in September. But we've been journeying through the book of Mark, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and so um, we are doing that, and we will be continuing to do that all the way until Easter. Um, and then obviously when Easter comes, we'll have hit the resurrection, and then we'll probably move on to something else after that. Um, today, as you know, is Super Bowl Sunday. One of the biggest celebrations, uh, particularly in this country, but worldwide. Um, the Super Bowl every year. Um, it's one of the most watched, if not the most watched, primetime television thing uh, all year long. And it's like that every single year. It doesn't matter who plays. Um, it's one of the biggest parties of the year. And because it's one of the biggest parties of the year, whatever city it invites uh, the, it's, you know, that hosts the Super Bowl, um, it is also statistically apparently known as the greatest or one of the greatest instances of sex trafficking that happens in the U.S. Um, on this day. So on this day, um, apparently they think uh, somewhere in the upwards numbers of five to 10,000 new uh, girls and boys will be pulled into sex trafficking today. Um, I was watching this little thing, and the reason why I tell you that is because um, I, I'm always, Super Bowl Sunday is always a bit hard for me, but... Uh, even when uh, my team isn't playing or not, but it's just a bit hard because of that fact. Um, but did you know that the sex trafficking industry grosses $32 billion a year? Um, and today is one of the highest grossing days in that, uh, if you want to call it an industry or market or whatever the place might be. But I was watching um, a, a video online the other day um, that somebody had put up on Facebook, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, of a, it's an interview with this lady um, who... Uh, was into sex trafficking and then she escaped from it and then she wrote a book. One of the more striking things that she said was that she loved her pimp. That that's the reason why she went through all of it. And the thing that drove her uh, in some ways kind of crazy was this idea that nobody would love her and nobody could possibly actually love her other than her pimp who would beat her, who would take all her money and literally treat her like trash. Um, and so she just kept going back and back and doing whatever it is that he said um, he would do. And if, eventually, in the end, she got out. And one of the things that she says she realized is that she walked into the arms of a Savior and she started letting Jesus be Jesus in her life. Um, I tell you that story because I want you to kind of hold on to that as we go into this text today. Because today we get to a, a portion of the text that's very, very interesting. It's two separate stories. One of the Syrophoenician woman. Um, who has a daughter who's uh, possessed by spirit, right, uh, unclean spirit, and then the deaf and mute man who comes, uh, who's brought to uh, Jesus by his friends and then receives healing. Now, normally I think you would take these two texts to, uh, separately and you would look at them separately, perhaps, but I think they're best, uh, they're best looked at together because I think when you look at them together, what they show us is a very, very clear and striking picture of who Jesus is and therefore, who we're supposed to be because of who Jesus is. That more so than the questions that people might raise about what Jesus says, and it's a very interesting thing that Jesus says in this passage, if you want, uh, and you'll see when we read it, and also more so than what he does with a deaf man, more so than that, this passage illustrates and shows us the gospel in a striking way that I think other passages don't when you put them together. So that's why I wanted to look at them together. And indeed, I wanted to see in and through these texts today, how we ought to let Jesus be Jesus. Because that's the question we've been asking, right? Who is this guy? Who is Jesus? And are we going to really let God be God? And in this case, let Jesus be Jesus, who is indeed God. So if you have your Bibles, or Patrick's going to pull it up on the screen, we're going to read together Mark 7, verses 24 through 37, all the way to the um, beginning of chapter 8. Uh, and then we will jump right into the Word. So Jesus then got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician race. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he, Jesus, was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him and said to him, Yes, Lord. 
But even the dogs under the table feed from the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Again, then he went out of the region of Tyre and came through side on the sea, uh, to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay hands on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself, put his fingers into ears, and after spinning, he touched his tongue with the saliva, and looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Epaphatha, that is, be opened. And, the, and his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began to speak plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks this day. And on this day, we want to raise up a prayer also for the many out in the world who will suffer on this day. And indeed, we pray that throughout this world, that we would all allow you to be Jesus in our lives, to be God. And so, Father, would you explain and open up this text to us? May it not be I who speak, but you and your divine voice who speak into our hearts and not into just our ears. And indeed, may we gaze into the heavens as Jesus did and praise your mighty name for you are God and we are your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Right before this text, last week, we saw that Jesus was having a discussion with the Pharisees, right, and the disciples about um, cleanly laws, or about food laws, and what you need to do, and what you don't need to do, and then Jesus declares all the laws to be uh, pretty much fulfilled. He's saying, I've done all the laws, so you don't got to do it anymore, right? You can eat what you want, and you can, you can be clean through me, right, And which was a big thing. So after he's done this, he then escapes, in some ways, into a region of Tyre, which is the Sea of Galilee is kind of here. Um, actually, Patrick, can you pull up that map real quick? Um, the, the Sea of Galilee, is you'll see on the map as he pulls it up, um, it's right in here, uh, and then Sea of Galilee is up at the top, and then Tyre is way up there by the big word, it says Phoenicia, right? So he escapes to a Gentile territory called Tyre, and the reason why he's doing that, if you remember um, earlier in the, in the earlier chapters, after he sends the disciples out and then he brings them back in, what does he try to do? He tries to get away, right? And he tries to go to a separate place to get some privacy, to rest a little, and every single time he tries, he gets interrupted by a bunch of people, and then he feeds them, and he does all these things, and so Jesus is trying to escape again, to have some privacy, to have some rest with his disciples. But again, just like last time, he enters into a house in the very remote region of Tyre, which is right next to the Mediterranean Sea right there. And yet right as he enters into the house, this woman comes to him uninvited, interrupts his wanted and desired peace and rest time, and then bows and falls at his feet and says, you got you to gotta heal my daughter. She's got an evil spirit and she's possessed. Now, there's a parallel text in Matthew, I believe it's in chapter 10, that kind of tells the same story. And Matthew tells it a little differently than Mark. But basically, here's what happens, okay? She comes to his feet, she, she bows down right before him, and then she bows, and then she starts to beg, right? That word to ask is, is literally also to mean, means to beg. She starts begging Jesus, be like, Jesus, you got to help me. Jesus, you got to help me. My daughter, she's been possessed. She's possessed with the evil spirit. You have to heal her. But in the Matthew text, more clearly, but even in here, basically, Jesus doesn't say anything. He doesn't actually answer her. He starts to ignore her, which is kind of odd, right? And as he's ignoring her, she, then she keeps on begging, just keeps on. She will not take no for an answer. and just keeps on begging, keeps on begging, keeps on begging, keeps on begging. And finally then, Jesus, after she begs for a while, in the Matthew text, it even says that the disciples are trying to get her to leave. But she will not take no for an answer. And so upon begging and continuously begging, Jesus then finally answers her. And then this is what he says. Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but Jesus in some ways essentially calls her a dog. Yes, I said it. Jesus, it seems, kind of insults this lady by giving her this interesting parable. But before we get to that, Mark takes a lot of time to explain to us who she is. She's a Gentile, which is a you know, non-Jew, right? She's Syrophoenician, which means she's from the area of Phoenicia in the, in the land of Syria, right? She's of this race, and she's a woman, and her daughter is possessed by an evil spirit. So if you're counting, that's unclean times three. Woman, which, and women aren't supposed to come up to rabbis in public and do this sort of thing, particularly not in a, also another house uninvited. Secondly, she's a Gentile, not a Jew, so again, that doesn't make her... Uh, her case any better. And then third, her daughter has been possessed with an evil spirit. She's unclean, unclean, unclean to the, to the nth degree in some sense. And yet she has the audacity and the 
gumption to come before Jesus and then bow before him. A big, big, big no-no. And if you remember what we just talked about last week, we had just gotten through a discussion about being unclean. And so the readers of Mark, particularly when they're reading this, they're going to be like, oh my, oh my, oh my, what is this lady doing? And yet she does what she does. She clearly is willing to fight for her daughter and will take nothing but a yes for an answer and will not go away. Now, expect a situation like this, right? Just maybe pretend. Pretend one of my kids is really sick, even potentially demon-possessed. And I have heard, as this woman has, heard of a great teacher who goes around and wherever he goes, he casts out demons and he heals people. And then he preaches with authority nobody has ever heard before. And so she goes, believing what she's heard, and then she goes in panic, in desperation to be like, you got to help my little girl. She might die if you don't help her. And we've heard this before with Jairus' daughter in the past, right? And she goes. Now, in a situation like this, you would expect, yeah, it's kind of weird that she's ignoring her, right? And she doesn't say anything. That kind of seems like, Jesus, you're being a little mean here. Maybe you should be a little more considerate. But even then, finally, when Jesus does say something, what do you expect him to say? Now, if it were me, I would be like, okay, fine. Fine, 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 fine. I'll heal her. Just, just go. Just go. I, I got it. Don't worry about it. I got it. That's what we do our kids. That's maybe what your parents do when you annoy the crap out of them and just keep asking for things and they keep saying no or they keep trying to ignore you and just keep on going, keep on going. Finally, at the end, they give in and they go, okay, fine, just leave me alone. If you just, just be quiet, I'll just give whatever. But he doesn't do that. Maybe you expect Jesus to be really, really friendly. Maybe, maybe Jesus was, you know, consumed with something and maybe you think, hey, Jesus is really nice, right? It's Jesus after all. And so he would go and then he'd be like, okay, yes, lady, woman, I heal her. But none of those things happen, does it? Jesus goes, upon being continuously begged to heal her, right? She says something like this. He says, wait, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bed and throw it to the dogs. Again, did Jesus just call this lady a dog? Kind of. What Jesus is doing is giving her a very short parable, which is the Greek word for metaphor, right? So she gives... He gives her a metaphor most likely common in those days that most people knew, right? So what is exactly, what exactly is Jesus saying here? Let's break it down. Children here refer to who? Jews. Who are the dogs? Gentiles, okay? Children, Jews, dogs, Gentiles, right? And culturally, many times Jews, to be mean and also to look down upon the Gentiles because Jews thought they were the better race, right? They would call Gentiles dogs. And dogs back then particularly, didn't, were not looked upon favorably. I know today, that in this day and age, we love dogs. I, I, apparently, I heard Sabrina's family just got a dog. Really cute, okay? Right? We love dogs, but when, when, if you were to call somebody a dog back in the day, that's not good, because dogs were seen as unclean, vile, you know, like, dangerous, and they're just not good. They're wild beings. And so, in many ways, this is one of those things where he says that. So, it, most times, Jews would call Gentiles dogs as to insult them. But more on this in a little bit. Follow with me here, okay? But the quote, I think, if you, if you translate it better, I think it should read like this. Let the Jews be satisfied first, for it isn't right to take the bread that belongs to them that's supposed to satisfy the Jews first and then give it to the Gentiles. The word for satisfied is the same word that was used a few chapters back when Jesus feeds the 4,000 or 5,000, I should say, right? And it says that they all ate and they were satisfied, which means they were completely full. So Jesus is saying basically this. I'm here to do something very specific. The first thing I'm here to do is to deal with the Jews, to redeem them, to make sure they know the gospel, to make sure they know why I am here. Then once that is done, the Gentiles will get what they're supposed to get. Jesus' mission, side note, is for the Israelites first. And then... His then calling, and he does it to the disciples later, is to go and take it to the nations. That's, in many ways, the disciples' job is to take it to the nations, to the Gentiles. But back to the dogs for a second. This is one of those passages where people read it, and if you read commentaries or other people, they'll be like, I think Jesus just called that lady a dog. Or uh, that B word that we won't say, right? But that word for dog is very interesting. The word for dog that he uses is what's called the diminutive form of dog. 
If you speak Spanish, it's adding the I-T-O, the ito, to anything. Anyone speak Spanish in here? I do a little bit, right? Whenever someone says, whenever someone asks me, do you speak Spanish? I go, yo hablo un poquito, right? It's about the only thing I remember from Spanish in college, right? It's basically saying, I speak Spanish just a little bit. But the word for little in Spanish is poco. And if you add the ito, that means like little, little. Like it's an emphasis on being like, I really speak just, just, just a tiny bit, right? And so if you, if, you say that, if you say that's my brother, my hermano, you say that if that's my little brother, that's my hermanito, right? You know what I'm saying? That's the diminutive. So Jesus uses the diminutive of the word dog, which basically means little dog or like house dog, like pet kind of thing, right? So I think the reason why Jesus does it, I think, is because he's not trying to insult her. He's just trying to relay upon her a parable. And as you know of Jesus, Jesus does this a lot. He doesn't really speak like a normal person does. He says all these crazy things about parables and soils and seeds and, you know, mustard seeds and all these other things. And so that's what he's doing to this lady. He's telling her what he's all about, but he's doing it in code language, which is really hard to understand. Now, imagine the situation with me again. If you were this lady and your daughter was deathly possessed by a demon, and you wanted Jesus to cure her, and you're begging and begging and begging with all the desperation and the emotion and everything, you're at his feet, you follow me for him, you're saying, please, 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 will you heal me? And then all of a sudden, Jesus goes, let the children be fed first, and then don't throw it to the dogs. How would you react? Now, if it were me, I'd be like, excuse me? Excuse me? Did you, did, did you just, ex- What? I'd be all sorts of angry. I'd probably start to curse and be like, oh, hey, you know, like I just be like, mm, no, no, you just did not, right? If, you, if there's anything you learn from movies and films these days, you don't mess with the mom when her daughter is sick. Just don't mess with the mama. Don't do it. Even in the animal kingdom, we know that don't mess with the mama when the children are sick. That's just, that's, just, that's just rule number one. You don't do it. But Jesus, in some ways, gives her this very confusing code talk parable thing about dogs. It kind of seems like maybe Jesus is insulting her and things like that. And this lady... As profound as it might be, she goes and she answers right back. What does she say? Yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat from under the table the crumbs that the children drop, basically, right? Do you hear what I said? Yes, Lord. But even the dogs on the table feed on the children's crumbs. Now, consider this for a second here. When Jesus speaks in parables throughout the gospel, what normally happens? Do you remember? Do people get what he's talking about? No, never. They're always like, Jesus, um, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain to me, please? Uh, you're kind of confusing me. Whoop. Right? She's like, oh my God. And then, and then what does Jesus normally do? Do you still not understand? Like, are you like, you know, like, are you a little, you know, like, why don't you get it? But here's a lady in a panic mode, begging out of desperation for her daughter's life, essentially. And Jesus tells her a parable, and then she responds in the same code language that Jesus is talking about. She's the only person throughout the entire Gospel of Mark that actually understands a parable of Jesus and then responds to him using the parable language. The only one. Crazy. Even if you get beyond the fact that emotionally I would have no brain function to try to understand what the crap Jesus is talking about. Even if you get beyond that, just the fact that she does is just out of this world. And even more so, her response, she says, yes, Lord. The word for Lord in Greek is kyrios, which is basically the word for Lord that you use. And she's the only human being in the entire gospel of Mark to call Jesus Lord. The only other times you see the word used in the entire Gospel of Mark is when Jesus calls God Lord. Here's a woman, not a Jew, a Gentile, unclean, all that business, and yet she comes at Jesus' feet. She knows exactly who she's dealing with, and so she calls him Lord, and she begs for him to heal. And when he gives her a parable, she knows exactly what she's talking about. She's saying, I know I'm not worthy. I know I'm just like a dog. I know I'm a Gentile. I know I'm unclean. I know I'm unworthy. I know all these things, but I also know who you are, and I know you will feed me the little crumbs if you wish. Any other person in the situation in the world would be like, oh, you just did not talk to me that way. Do you know who I am? You cannot treat me like this. I'm a human being. You can't treat me like this. You think I'm a dog? Like, you seriously? She would start to assert 
her rights and be like, you cannot treat me this way. What did I ever do to you? What did I ever do wrong? You really think I'm that bad? But she doesn't, does she? She admits the same thing that Jesus was trying to convince the people in the passage before, that indeed she understands how terrible and wicked she is. And yet this is what she's saying. She's saying, I'm not begging you to heal my daughter because I've done anything good, because I'm worth it, because of my race, because of my status, because of who I am. I'm begging you to heal my daughter. Why? Because I know you are good and you will. It's a fundamental position that we are all supposed to take. Not because of what I've done or what I can do or I will do, because I know, God, you are good. So please heal me and my daughter. She asks, not based on her goodness, but on the goodness of Jesus. And because she understands, Jesus then looks at her and the Matthew text goes, what an answer. And in the Mark text, he goes, because of your answer, go. You're going to find that your daughter is just fine. And she goes. She finds that her daughter is just fine. She doesn't get offended, does she? She doesn't get hurt, does she? She knows exactly who she is dealing with, and that Jesus is indeed God. Do we know that Jesus is God? But let's move on. So right after this, then, Jesus leaves the area of Tyre, and then he goes into the area of the Decapolis, which is where, in the same area, right, where he uh, threw the demon out of the man into the pigs and into the ocean. Remember that? He goes into that area, and as he gets there, immediately, as soon as he gets there, again, he gets bombarded by people, and they're a group of friends. I don't know how many, but a group of friends who brings a deaf man who also speaks with difficulty, a deaf and mute man. And they bring to him, and they say, basically, they implore him. They, again, beg him in the same way. They say, Jesus, you got to lay hands on him and heal this man. And then do you notice what Jesus does? Ben, I'm going to use another example. Jesus takes the man, and then it's a bunch of people, and they're like, Jesus, you got to heal this deaf and mute man. He's had a really tough life. you got to do something for him. And then what Jesus does, he just takes him to a place where nobody's watching, pretend nobody's there, and then he takes his ear. It's kind of weird, and then he puts it into his ear, and then he spits on his hands, and then he touches his tongue. Germaphobe. Oh, germaphobe. And then he looks up to heaven, and then he groans. And then he says, epaphatha, which means be opened. And as soon as he says that, then ta-da, Mr. Deaf and Mute Man is no longer deaf and mute. And he speaks like a normal person and everything is great. Thank you, Ben. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it not seem that Jesus is kind of doing his own like magic, uh, abracadabra kind of act? It's like, let me do this. You know, know, like, let me put the ears. Let me touch this. Let me do this. Let me say this, right? The epaphatha basically almost seems like Jesus going abracadabra, pew done. And a lot of people think that's what he's doing, which is interesting because what has Jesus done in the past? Every time he encounters somebody like this, how does he heal people? He's just like, right? How does he calm the storm? Shut up and be still. What does he do to the, what does he do to the little girl that's sleeping or that's dead? Sweetie, it's time to get up. Even the lady who's been bleeding for years and years and years, what happens? How does she get healed? She literally just, boom, done. Nothing fancy, cool as the other side of the pillow. He just does what he does. He doesn't even think it's a big deal. But for whatever reason, with this person, he goes and he goes through all that stuff. What's going on? Doesn't it seem a little weird? Doesn't it seem a little out of place? Now, don't get anything twisted. Jesus doesn't need to do anything cool or formula or anything like that to heal the man. Jesus is Jesus. He's God. He can do whatever he wants, however he wants to. He spoke the entire world into being by being like, light, thank you, right? He doesn't have to do anything. But why is he doing that? A deaf and a mute man, supposedly and presumably, has been like this all his life, which means entire, the majority or if not all of his life, he can't hear a single thing. And because he can't hear a single thing, he doesn't know what words sound like. And because he doesn't know what words sound like, he can barely talk, right? Now, I don't know about you, but in movies or even in real society, if you ever encounter one, 
People who are deaf and therefore mute, they get made fun of a lot. They're a public spectacle. And to make it worse, if people talk crap about you, you can't hear what they're saying. But you know and you can see that they're clearly talking crap about you, but you can't hear a thing. So Jesus, knowing this about the man, takes him and says, people don't need to see what's about to happen here. And then Jesus does something incredible that you cannot miss. He begins to speak in a language that only this man's going to understand. He starts to essentially do his version of sign language. He takes the man and pulls him away. I don't want anyone looking at you because everyone's been looking at you and staring at you all your life. You're made, you've been made a spectacle your entire life. But let's pull away for a second. Let's just me and you go away for a second. Nobody needs to see this. It's just between me and you, you and God. And then he goes and then he first does what? He touches his ear. The very thing that's dead that he couldn't hear out of. Then he spits on his hands and then he touches his tongue, the very thing that won't let him speak. And then he looks up onto heaven as if to tell the man, this is what you're going to do in just one second. Looks, and then he groans and he says, be open. And as soon as that happened, the man speaks and hears as if he's been able to do it his entire life. Jesus connects on a level that you just don't see anywhere else. Did Jesus have to do that? No. But is it important for Jesus to do that? I think yes. Why? So that this man knows who God is. That, not he's just, that he's not just powerful, but that he's a loving and caring God unlike any you've seen before. That he hears all your hurts. He identifies with all your pain. He connects on an emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental level. On all levels, he knows exactly who you are and is willing to do the things that you need for him to do so that you can So how do these two texts then help us understand the gospel better? How do these stories help us to understand who Jesus is better and therefore help us understand who we are because of who Jesus is? Tim Keller's description of the gospel, what the gospel is, is one that I really, really like. He says this is what it is. He says the gospel is an understanding that you and I, all of us, that you are more wicked than you ever believed, but at the same time more loved and accepted than you ever dared to hope. The gospel tells us a contradicting truth, that you and I were unworthy, that we're not worthy of anything, that really at the heart of hearts, who we are, we're wicked and we're filthy and we're evil, we're selfish, we do terrible things, we think terrible things, we want terrible things, that we are not worthy of a perfect and almighty God, but at the same time, somehow, some way, we must believe that God loves us more than we ever could hope or imagine. That's the gospel. And you, in today's society, we think that the reason why most people don't know God is because they're too proud or they're too good, right? I don't need God. I didn't do anything bad. I don't need him. You can go ahead and take God. I don't need that. I don't need all those rules and all whatever. But there's two ways that we as people can fail to let God be God in our lives. One is to be too proud, is to think that you're too great, think that you don't need God. That's called the superiority complex. I'm too good for God. Are you kidding me? I don't need God. What are you talking about? But the other is just like it, as dangerous, if not maybe more dangerous, and that's the other way. I'm too awful to be loved. No one could dare possibly love me. Do you know who I am? I know you don't really know me because I had everything and everything's a secret, but if you really got to know me, do you think God could love me? Do you think the holy and perfect God that you say is all good and all perfect and all that? Do you actually think he could love me? People don't love me. How could God actually love me? And so we hold God off. How could he love me? It's what all those who are caught in sex trafficking tell themselves and convince themselves that indeed they are unlovable, unworthy, invaluable. They're basically pieces of nothing that can be tortured and beaten. And so then they devote their lives to their pimp because they think that they love their pimp and their pimp loves them. And if we're looking at the text this week and last week, Mark is telling us something very, very clear. Don't get it twisted. Indeed, yes, we know that we are wicked. 
if left to our own abilities and to our own vices, we would do some terrible and wicked things. I stand as a testament of that. But just as the woman has clearly understood and shown us the basis of which why I am loved and cared for is not because of who I am, but because of who God is. It don't matter what you've done or what you're capable of. His goodness, his character, his grace, mercy, and glory, that is the thing and the character by which he loves you. So it matters not what you've done. And that's what the woman goes, I know I'm not worth it, God. I know I'm not worth your life. I know I'm not good enough, but I know you are more than good enough. So please love me. Please love me. Is this how you think of yourself? Truly, nobody could love this. I'm not fill in the blank. If people knew the real truth about who I was, how I was, then they surely would not know me. They surely wouldn't want anything to do with me. And again, God loving me? If the people that I know who are just like me and terrible on their own right can't love me, how could indeed God love me? How does that even make any sense? And if you're paying attention to this text, just as Jesus does with the deaf and mute man, he takes him and he's calling us to stop looking at ourselves and to gaze up unto the heavens and say, God, because of you, I am free. Because of your love, I am free. Because of who you are, I am the person that I'm made to be. That there is indeed a God who takes the time and the patience to take a deaf and a mute man to speak to him in ways that only he would understand so that he would know that he is indeed loved and cared for. There's a little more to this. And here's where I'll finish. It's not just good enough, in my opinion, that God loves in this way. Indeed, God is one that loves in a way that we'll never really fully comprehend. In a, in a way, God loves us in a way that we'll never ever actually meet probably in any other human being on earth, but just in God. He loves us to a degree. But there's a little bit more. Did you notice that while Jesus was healing the man, in the process of touching his ears and touching his tongue, and then as he was looking up to heaven, did you notice what he did? He groans and then says, be opened. The Greek word for that is stenazo, one that indicates that something that you do, it's when you groan and you moan because you're hurting inside. Now, think with me for a second. If Jesus knows, and he clearly knows, and he clearly knows who he is, he clearly knows what he's capable of, if Jesus knows that he's going to heal this man like that, and he knows what he's doing for the man, wouldn't you be kind of like, oh yeah, I know, I'm good. Like, You wouldn't be sad, you wouldn't be hurting. You're giving man life that he's never had before. Why? What, what is there anything to be groaning about? What is there anything to be moaning about, right? You would just be like, dude, let's go, let's party it up. You're about to, have, you're about to finally have ears that work and a tongue that works, and you're going to be able to do whatever it is that you're made to do. But he groans before he says to God, be open, and before he heals the man. Why? Well, a few verses earlier, Mark tells us that the friends of this deaf man brings along a man who cannot hear and who speaks or spoke with difficulty. This is why reading in Greek is really important because that word, spoke with difficulty, is a Greek word called moglelalon. I know, sounds weird. But that word is only used one time in all the New Testament, right here, and it's only used one other time in the entire Bible, and that's in Isaiah 35.6. And Isaiah 35, 6 says this, Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Now, anytime you see this sort of thing, and Mark uses Isaiah a lot, I know this is a Bible study lesson, but stay with me here. Anytime Mark does this sort of thing, it's trying to point you back to something. It's trying to tell you that Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. And he points back to Isaiah 35. And let me read the entire passage for you, at least the first six verses, or seven verses. And this is what it says. This is Isaiah prophesying about something that will happen much later, okay? It says this, The wilderness and the desert will be glad. 
And the Araba will rejoice and blossom like the crocus and will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shouts of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord Yahweh and the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted. Strengthen the feeble. Say to those with an anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, this is important. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, and the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Mark is trying to tell us something. When Jesus is doing all that he's doing, when Jesus has done what he's done for the lady, what he's done for the deaf and mute man, he clearly understands what this is all about. He's signaling to something much bigger And Isaiah tells us that in one day, the nations that have been exhausted, the people that have been uh, messed up, the people who have been hurting, that they will indeed leap. The people who couldn't walk, they'll leap. The people who couldn't talk, they'll shout. The people who couldn't hear, will hear again. The blind, their eyes be opened because why? God comes with a vengeance. Now, if you've ever seen movies or action movies, what happens when somebody comes with a vengeance? The person that's been hurting whoever I'm coming after, they're going to get hurt real bad. I'm coming for you. If Ben is messing with my family and I come with a vengeance, what's going to happen to Ben? Not good things, right? Don't be scared. It says God is going to come with a vengeance so that the blind, they can finally see. So that the deaf, they can finally hear. So the mute will finally talk. The same mute spoke with difficulty will shout for joy. Then why is Jesus groaning with pain? He's coming with vengeance. He's taking out all those people who's going to do all those things to his people. But is that the story that we know? Jesus doesn't come with a vengeance. Actually, he does come with a vengeance. But on who? You? Me? Sinners? All the wicked and the undeserving? Who does he come with a vengeance for? Himself. The punishment that was for you and I, not so. The penalty deserved for our wickedness, not so. He comes with a vengeance for himself, retribution for himself. And because he knows he's going to take it real soon, he groans. And even in the middle of the groaning, he goes and looks up to God and says, be open, and he heals the man. Such is the gospel, friends. Not on who you are, not on what you've done, but on who he is. A God who will not let you, if you let him be God, serve the punishment that you and I all deserve. A God who takes us, yes, dogs, unworthy of being at the table, mute and deaf in all that we are, a God who lets us then become the children to eat of the table, to eat of the celebration, to do what we were meant to do, which is to love, to live, to be joyful, patient, kind. Are you letting Jesus be Jesus in your life? Or do you think you're not worth it? Or do you think you're too good? As I invite the praise team back up to finish in worship, I want you to think to yourselves. Ask yourselves. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter who and what your history is like, no matter what you think of yourself, the gospel tells us that indeed, yes, we don't measure up to much. And a quick glance into our lives quickly shows us that, yeah, we don't really measure up to much. We don't amount to much. But Jesus, because of who he is, tells us that you and I are worth it. Because he's good. Do you believe? Are you willing to let Jesus be Jesus in your life? Will you come to the feet of the Father and say, Father, will you heal me? 
not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Do you trust that indeed when Jesus sees you, sees your hurts and your pains, all the deep scars and the things that you have in your life that nobody knows, that he'll take those and he'll love you in the way that you need to be loved if you just let him. Will you come to the Father? Eat of the table. Sing praises unto the King. Jesus the King, the one who knows who is coming to bring the vengeance upon himself is asking that you let him be your God. Are you willing to let Jesus be Jesus?